Hi, so and now we've got our uh, <laughs> final panelists just stylishly coming in right at the start. That's great. Um, so I'm Nels Pearson, director of the Humanities Institute and director of the School of Humanities. And I want to thank Dean Greenwald for his support of tonight's event, as well as my associate directors, Dr. Patricia Berry and Dr. Geraldine Johnson, as well as our invaluable program coordinator, Elizabeth Hastings, without whom this would not have happened. Where is Elizabeth? She Oh, she's out in the hallway waiting, so she's working, right. Um, so I also wanted to just briefly introduce the panelists, and then I'll have to dim the lights to do a brief intro, because they tell me I have to do that to show a few slides that I wanted to show. Uh, but again, as Dean Greenwald said, we have a very uh, wonderful panel here tonight representing a variety of years of graduation and types of careers and types of majors and minors. And in order of their graduation year, those are as you can see in your program, Jennifer Locke, who was a Spanish and English major with a women's studies minor graduating in 2003, who is now director of project management at Sarah's Therapeutics uh, in Cambridge. Then Sarah Howe Elliott, who graduated in 2007 with an English and art history double major and a philosophy, I'm sorry, with a history major and minors in art history, Asian studies, and classical, classical studies, who is now the director of online communications with the US Chamber of Commerce and who's up from Silver Spring, right? Yep. So she's come a good way, and we thank her for that. Uh, Megan Kuznuski, who is a graduate in 2014 of English and Art History, double major, also a graduate of the James Joyce Seminar, which uh, gives her an extra leg up in the world, <laughs> um, and a certain degree of craziness, I think, to, to go through that. And then a philosophy minor as well, and she's a graduate of St. John's University School of Law, and is currently an associate with the international law firm Clyde & Company. Uh, we also have Ariel Miranda, who graduated in 2015 with a major in philosophy, with minors in peace and justice and business law and several other minors as well. We couldn't fit them all <laughs> on, the, uh, on the program. And Ariel is a community associate with the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit at the City of New York as well as a steering committee member of New York Uptown Progressive Action. And in his spare time, he's also been a mayor's education consultant for New York City. So we've been very busy in the brief time since graduating. And we, a round of applause uh, for these folks. Um, so I just wanted to say a, a, a few brief things and about it's a little better like that. <laughs> about tonight. So now, now we'll we'll put them back up before you guys uh, have to talk. So, and I'll be brief. But uh, I just want to say that the Humanities Institute this year created a new series called the Humanities at Work, and it's devoted to the social and economic impact of the humanities. So, uh, together with the School of Humanities, we are hosting this event tonight because we don't often take the time to really showcase how our degrees translate into impactful careers and roles in society. Uh, we primarily major in the humanities, I would think, to satisfy our insatiable intellectual curiosity, our drive to comprehend the history and the scale and the possibility of human experience, to think and communicate creatively, theoretically, critically. But the story we often forget to tell is that en route to those goals, we acquire skills of analysis, problem solving, ingenuity, and the ability to articulate these ideas to different audiences that give us distinct advantages and make us crucial contributors in a variety of public and civic and professional scenarios, as our panelists represent. And if you haven't noticed, this is what I wanted to briefly show you, if you haven't noticed, the national discourse on the importance of the humanities is starting to recognize precisely this fact. The emphasis is now turning to the importance of the humanities uh, and the crucial role that they play in molding future leaders and professionals. For example, there have been a host of new books on these, on this topic. George Anders' wonderful book, You Can Do Anything, The Surprising Power of a Supposedly Useless Liberal Arts Education. Scott Hartley's great book, The Fuzzy and the Techie, which basically explains why liberal arts grads are doing so well in the tech world right now, which was part of a larger boom. If you just Google that, you'll find lots of arguments about that. Forbes magazine did an article in 2015 uh, whose headline was the liberal arts degree has become tech's hottest ticket. And one of the things, you know, Google is finding this out as well. I mean, one of the reasons is the ingenuity, the ability to analyze things across 
uh, and, and synthesize information and the ability to think outside of expected norms is really what they're finding is required in that field. Uh, Randall Strauss's book, A Practical Education, Why Liberal Arts Majors Make Great Employees, has a lot of excellent stories about why humanities majors are killing it in uh, the uh, Silicon Valley. Christian Madsberg, who was here on campus, has a great book called The Power of the Humanities in the Age of the Algorithm, in which he explains why his international consulting firm, based in Denmark and New York City, <coughs> hires only liberal arts majors. Right? They are strategically helping companies like Lego and uh, Reebok uh, think their way out of puzzles, and he wants only liberal arts majors to help him do that. You've got Microsoft's recent self-study which realized that liberal arts majors are the key to the future of artificial intelligence and to innovations in the tech world that are going to drive things forward. Google, even more importantly, in the recent self-study, this has all been all over the internet recently, they did a self-study of their company in which they thought they would find what they believed to be the case about their company, which was that algorithms and the ability to you know, be sci totally science-oriented would be the key to working at Google. They found that it wasn't true. They found that humanities-based skills were what were most crucial. Uh, I don't know why they have this guy reading Nietzsche. I'm not sure how I feel about that. But uh, anyway, <laughs> you know, with his dark glasses and reading Nietzsche. So, uh, you know, I just thought I'd say, if you look at some of the test data, like the graduate management test, the test that you take to get into grad school and business, well, look who scores well on you. What does it test? It tests quantitative reasoning, verbal reasoning, integrated reasoning, and analytical writing. Look who scores the best on it, philosophy history, art history, English, languages. Those are all in the top half of scores on that test. Who's actually in the lowest? And I'm sorry if we have any colleagues from business here. I know our, we have a great business school, but it's just worth pointing out. Accounting, business ed, marketing, <coughs> management, those are some of the lowest on the GMAT. The, look at the LSAT scores, and you know Megan can talk to this too. Philosophy majors are the highest scores on the LSAT, according to data from the Law School Admission Council, economics, history, English, arts and humanities. And you know those are doing better than the majors you think you're supposed to take, and, and that do prepare you very well for, for law school, uh, political science, criminal justice, psychology. Um, you know, so it's just things like this. At Scientific American, the editors recently took time out in the STEM debate to say, look, if we start getting too crazy with saying you have to take STEM, we're going to hobble our economy. <laughs> because they said, you know, this is why a lot of countries like Singapore and foreign countries that have not focused on liberal arts education because they think tech drives everything and professional education drives everything, they're starting to realize, wait, you know, the inventiveness of the liberal arts may be why the U.S. economy keeps rebounding. So. Um, you know, and you have politicians like Jeb Bush saying, you know, it's great to have a liberal arts degree, but you'll be working at a Chick-fil-A. Chick um, well, Jeb Bush studied Latin American studies at Texas Austin. Uh, Bush studied history. Mitt Romney was an English major. Cuomo, Huckabee. So, you know, Obama said don't take art history classes. And, you know, uh, and, and yet, you know, he's supposed to be a champion of liberal arts as well. So people on both sides of the aisle in politics have been kind of feeling that they have to say don't study liberal arts and humanities. But it's not true. They did. Um, so anyway, we have a lot of stuff like that up on our website at the Humanities at Work site. Uh, we have some more evidence and testimonials and things like that. But what's most important is to listen to the folks who have actually been in the degrees and have gone into the career world. So let me turn it over to them. Thanks very much. Um, so I graduated from Fairfield in 2003. I guess I'm the oldest person on this panel. I don't consider myself that old, but <laughs> I guess I am. I had a double major in um, the English and Spanish and a minor in women's studies. And I studied these things because they were interesting to me, um, because I love learning. Um, and because I really wanted to be bilingual. Um, so I, when I graduated in 2003, I expected to um, take a job at Fairfield Prep as a Spanish teacher, because that made sense, right? Like, you have a Spanish degree, let's do something with that. Um, and interestingly, I was in a panel uh, in 2003 in women's studies, and uh, a guy from UBS came in, and he was talking about the challenges of women um, uh, in the business world. And I took that as a bit of a personal challenge because he didn't offer any solutions. And so I sort of said to myself, um, I've got this double major in English and Spanish, and uh, 
damn it, I'm going to go into the business world. Uh, and so that's what I did. So um, I returned back to Boston, and uh, I got my first job in, uh, in nonprofit. And I was running a financial literacy organization in Boston, basically training executives to go into schools in the inner city and teach kids about money. Um, I was like 22 at the time and had absolutely no business doing this. But, um, but I could talk to a crowd. Um, I was an English major. Um, and communication was really, you know, sort of of key importance to me. So um, I worked in nonprofit for two years and realized that I couldn't pay the bills in Boston. Boston's a very expensive city. But I loved the work that I did because it was a great combination of my Jesuit education, right? Um, all the work that you guys are doing here and your community service. I, I thought nonprofit was a great, you know, kind of a great bridge. And then um, I landed accidentally, totally accidentally in consulting. And one of the things I'm going to sort of talk about is the fact that my career path has been quite circuitous. It's not been linear at all. In fact, I've just um, tried to be open to opportunities when they come my way and, you know, do my absolute best um, and, you know, sort of see where the tide leads me, um, which it, it finally has led me to something that I've been doing for 10 years. But uh, the early part of my career was, was very circuitous. So by luck, uh, I got a job at Cuba's Pharmaceuticals in Lexington, Massachusetts, uh, basically sweeping the floors. Um, so I've got this, I think I'm so bright, I've got this double major in English and Spanish, uh, minor in women's studies. I've had some pretty cool experience. I have no business being in science, absolutely none. I took a medical biology class at Fairfield, which I did not do very well in. Um, I took a chemistry class. <clears throat> and so here I am now at an antibacterial company um, scheduling meetings and ordering lunches. Um, and so uh, I started there um, in 2008. And I spent seven years working my ass off, um, really learning the business and listening to as many mentors and um, people who knew what they were talking about much more than I did. And I worked really long hours. I didn't care what it took. I would take any opportunity. <clears throat> um, uh, I, I would do any kind of research. Uh, and little by little, my work started to you know, pay off. Um, and so uh, after seven years at Cubist, um, I ended up launching my first antibiotic drug, which for me was sort of the pinnacle of my career because um, I worked on a drug for seven years that will save millions of people's lives um, in the time that it's on the market. So in terms of advice, uh, I want to say, first of all, be open to opportunity. Um, there's no way I could have predicted in 2003 that I would be working in drug development for the rest of my career. And I hope to be doing this until I'm very old. Um, and I hope to have a lot more drug approvals. But I think, um, you know, with a liberal arts education, um, just like you're excited that, you, that you're in art history or you're in calculus, uh, you know, you'll be excited to be in whatever field that you're in, but you could never predict that now. So you have to be open to opportunity as it comes along. And it will come along. Um, if you're smart and you're motivated and you communicate well, um, I joke, I actually have no technical skills, like none. Um, my skills are really in people management and communication, uh, in, team, in team management, in leadership, and these are all things that I learned as part of my liberal arts education. Um, I don't have a technical background. Um, I didn't study biology or chemistry or microbiome. That wasn't even a thing in 2003. So be open to opportunity. Um, two, your network is gold. So I learned this way too late in my career. But <laughs> it turns out that you should all have a LinkedIn account. Um, and you should make friends with your smart high school friends, with your parents' friends, with your neighbors, with your professors, with, your, uh, with other students that you go to Fairfield with, because people get jobs through their networks, because people like to hire people that they know. And so I would encourage you to really um, use your network and to find opportunities within your network. 
Um, and we all will give you our contact information so that you can add us to your network. Um, so I think this is a really important factor is to, um, is to use that network. So my, other, my third piece is work hard and be humble. So, um, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, you, you just have to put the time in. You graduate from a great school and you think, I am too smart to be doing this. And I'll tell you a little story besides my own. <clears throat> my brother Johnny uh, worked for the United States government for seven years for the TSA. And his first job at the TSA uh, was counting change in the airport. My brother is a special agent with the FBI in Boston now. And he started by counting change in the TSA. So <clears throat> I think the lesson there is put your head down, be humble, and work hard. You've got to prove yourself. Every, every one of us have had to prove ourselves um, as we started our new, our new careers. Um, liberal arts educations are a brilliant choice. And the reason why they're a brilliant choice is that they make students well-rounded, they make them learning agile, they make them adaptable, emotionally intelligent, and curious. You guys have strong writing and communication skills, and you'll use these throughout the rest of your career. And you also have critical thinking skills. If you studied a technical skill in university in your undergrad, there's a good chance that actually whatever you studied would be out of date by the time you started your career or you know, a little bit later on. Like I said, microbiome therapeutics wasn't even a thing. So if I tried to study something related to it, we would have been already too late by the time I, um, by the time I you know, started my career in that, in that field. And then, you know, I think employers, and I was actually talking to a bunch of other um, members of my senior leadership team at Ceres, and one of the things we were saying is that um, employers value work ethic. They value creativity, um, and they value liberal arts educations because you guys have the ability, as we all do, to think critically and to apply these skills in your career. And so um, I think it was a brilliant choice, and it certainly, as you can see from the panel, um, it's been a brilliant choice for all of us. So um, good luck, and uh, I want to put my money where my mouth is. So um, I have business cards up here, and I have my notes. So um, please reach out if you're um, interested in drug development, if you just want to talk about my ridiculously circuitous uh, career path. Um, if you're ever in Boston, I'd love to take you out. So um, uh, your network is incredibly important, and I want to be a part of that network as well. Um, so I, my career. Um, I did not do any internships. I didn't even know that internships were really a thing when I was uh, here at Fairfield. Um, I worked summers at Walgreens in the photo department, back when they had photo departments. <laughs> Don't even have them anymore. Um, and at the beauty counter, too, yeah, <laughs> all the things. Um, so my professional career got started, uh, in, and it was actually through a Fairfield connection. Um, it was senior year, kind of winter slash spring, and it was like, oh, I, I should probably figure out what I want to do after graduation. Uh, luckily, um, through my advisor, Dr. Donka Lee in the history department, um, she knew uh, another alum who was working at the Korea Economic Institute as, uh, down in D.C. as the administrative assistant, um, and she had gotten promoted and now they were looking for a new office manager, executive assistant. Um, and this was back in 2007, uh, before the Great Recession. So it was actually, they were having trouble finding people. So um, this uh, um, alum, Julia, reached out to uh, Dr. Lee and said, hey, do you know any um, Fairfield students who are looking for a job? Dr. Lee passed it on to me. I'm like, hey, I've got an Asian. I think she contacted me because I was an Asian studies minor. Um, and so I applied because I knew I wanted to, to uh, move down to DC. It was just, I'd kind of made a list of cities that I would be okay living in. And so that was where I was concentrating my, my search. And so DC, um, you know, something in Asian studies, let's apply. Um, I got an interview, went down um, and talked to the president of, of the organization. Um, he later contacted uh, some of my professors for references and uh, just to, to make sure that I actually was more talkative 
than I had been at the interview. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, I think one of my professors said, yeah, just, just let her warm up and then you can't shut her up. Um, so I, I ended up getting the job and I worked uh, at the Korea Economic Institute, which um, did South Korea economic policy and also some North Korea security policy work. Um, worked there for about two years, and then I got promoted to be the director or associate director for programs and the internship coordinator. Um, and that promotion kind of came about because I had proven myself over the, the previous couple of years in that I was organized and I could take on large projects and get them done. So I looked into like what else could I do that kind of fits this thing I like to do um, and I found project management. Um, and so on kind of my own time I went and took classes in project management and then um, studied and got my professional certification in project management. Um, so now I'm a, a PMP. Um, get to put that after my name. So that's always that's actually fun. a very difficult certification to get. Yeah. It's like one of the hardest tests I've ever sat for. Yeah, yeah. It's, yes. like, <laughs> it's like three hours on a computer, multiple choice. And they and the questions are tricky. They are very tricky. They're tricky. They try to trick you. You're like, wait a second. Um, and so actually, I mean, just to go off on a tangent on that, I mean, the ability to kind of read and parse something um, and kind of look for those gotchas was something that my liberal arts degree really helped with, I think, being able to kind of read between the lines and kind of you know, figure out what was going on. Um, so anyway, so got my project management degree, continued to do event planning uh, and kind of membership relations at the chamber. Um, but at the same time, I was looking for how I could, you know, really get into the project management um, side of things. And the opportunity opened up on the Chamber's communication team um, for a web production manager, uh, which I didn't quite understand what that was, but hey, it sounded production is close to project. Let's <laughs> see what that is like. Um, so I was able to uh, kind of somehow convince um, the head of that team to uh, give me a chance, basically saying, you know, anything I don't know now, I can learn um, because I've proven myself um, at the chamber over the last couple of years. Um, the only pieces of advice that I would, um, or, or, or bits I'd like to pull out of um, my story would be that, once again, don't expect it to be a linear progression from one uh, job to the next just kind of start out, figure out what you like to do. I would say that kind of the holy grail, the hitting the jack box, uh, jackpot, is when you can find something that gives you the ability to um, have autonomy in your job, that you can kind of direct a bit what you're doing, that you can uh, seek mastery of what you're doing and that you have a purpose, that you feel that there is some type of purpose um, in what you're doing every day from nine to five. Um, I, I think that, that those are, are three goals to kind of look for. Um, I also think that uh, you can look for each job to kind of build your toolbox of skills. So if you look at a job description, and you can do everything that they want. You're like, oh, I got that, I can do that, that's easy, totally fine, okay. That's probably not actually a job you should apply for. Uh, you know, your, your next step should always challenge you a bit. So if you can check every box on, on it, you know, you, you can do the job and you can probably convince them that you can do the job and you can get the job, but how long are you gonna actually be motivated and interested in it before you get bored because you're not really learning anything new. You're just doing what you already know. So that as you, you know, for your first job that may not be as relevant, but for that second job or that third job, once you do have some, some mastery, you know, always look for kind of what next thing can you add to your resume? 
because it's not only about what you can do for the employer, it's about what can the employer do for you. It's a relationship. Um, so just remember that. And last thing before I shut up um, would be about the whole going back to uh, what um, Dr. Pearson put on the board about humanities and tech. Um, because once again, I don't have specific like web development skills. I've kind of picked some things up over time. Um, but I'm mostly directing technical people about what to do based on what our communications and strategic goals are for the organization um, and how, and then saying how technology um, and web things can help us achieve those goals. So I would just say that if you don't understand technology or digital things, then you're not gonna really have any impact in the future. Um, technical people, they're the ones that are going to be building the things that have an impact. But if you have humanities and an understanding of the technical or digital realm, then you're going to be the ones that are telling the technical people what to build. And that's going to be the stuff that shapes the future. So that's all. Awesome. My name is Megan Kuznetsky. Uh I was a member of the class of 2014. Uh, while at Fairfield, I was also on the swim team. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but they won the MAC this year. Yeah. The girls did. Yeah. Uh, grateful that I wasn't here for that because I would not have been a member of that team. Uh, um, so I'm pretty much just going to ramble and use my experience as like a rough timeline. Um, I'll try to not talk forever. But um, so I came into Fairfield as a uh, English literature major, and then I realized that for the core, I had to take a religion class and either a philosophy or a religion class and another philosophy class. And it was only two more philosophy classes for the minor. And then I had Dr. Drake for philosophy. And I was like, I love this guy. I was an English literature art history major with a philosophy minor. Um, and then somewhere around my junior year, uh, I had always thought about law school. The LSAT, is, it was really hard. Um, and just applying to law schools and going on interviews, it's extremely difficult. And at least for the LSAT, I know that I know that the reason that I passed and did as well as I did on that exam was because of my majors, um, not art history, but English literature. The LSAT, it's it's three different parts, um, two of which are reading comprehension, and one of which is logic, and Philosophy, I mean, the logic, the logic section is really hard, but because I had taken philosophy and I knew how to think logically, I was able to succeed on that section. Um, and I started interviewing at law schools. And I'll tell you one, one story. I, I interviewed at Brooklyn Law School, and they had given me a scholarship. It wasn't as much as I wanted. And I went and I interviewed with their president, and something he asked me, this is law school, and I walk in and I sit down, and this guy, he decides to test me. He goes, what do you think about the Elgin Marbles? And I had this second where I like completely blanked and could not remember what the hell those were. I'm sure most of you have no idea what the hell those are. And I was like, uh, and then it came back to me, and I was like, oh, you mean the marbles from the Parthenon that are in uh, London that the Athens is trying to get back and then he like kind of settled back and we had a great conversation and they ended up offering me a full scholarship and to pay for my books and it was because of that interview not just because I was able to you know pull that out of my ass and talk about the Elgin Marbles but because I can communicate and that's something else that you know my humanities degree without a doubt has given me an edge up um, I'm really good at talking to people. Even right now is not a good example of it. But one-on-one, <laughs> -on -one, I swear, I'm really good at talking to people. And um, without a doubt, it's partially because of my humanities degree. Um, and then I went to law school. Um, and my first year, the class that I did the best in was legal writing, which is kind of funny because legal writing is entirely different than any kind of writing I've, I had ever done in my life. 
and it's entirely different than any kind of writing you, you would ever do. Um, but because I was an English literature major and because I took humanities classes and I had to write paper after paper after paper, I was really good at kind of BSing and, and writing and, and doing it quickly and doing it well. Even if what I was writing didn't necessarily make sense, it sounded good. Um, and I ended up doing really well in legal writing. And then the next year, I was on uh, a journal at my school. I was on one of the law reviews. And in my third year, I was elected to the board of that law review. And I ended up being in a position where I ran the largest single site moot court competition in the country, which I swear is impressive. It doesn't sound, you have no idea what I'm talking about, but it's impressive. And um, part of the reason I was able to do that, first get on the journal, was because at most law schools, they have a writing competition and you get graded against everyone else who takes the competition, who, who, who does this, and you have seven days to write eight pages based on a court, a fake court case, and you have to write eight pages of footnotes. Seven days, it was a 300 page packet, and then I had to read all that, that took a day and a half, and then I had to write eight pages and eight pages of footnotes, and it had to be grammatically perfect. Because anything that you got, any typo, spelling error, missing commas, they would dock you for it. And I had friends who were freaking out during it, and I was like, I wrote my final philosophy paper overnight. You know, <laughs> bad idea, but I, I bumped out 17 pages, sent it to Dr. Drake, and he was like, it was a 12-page paper, Megan, what the hell did you do? And I was like, I'm sorry, I had a lot to say. Um, but without a doubt, my humanities degree is the reason that I was able to succeed on that, to be on one of the top journals at my school, and then I was able to communicate and be articulate, and that came from being able to write well and having read a lot of really impressive writing. Um, and that led me to get elected to the e-board, and from there, that has led me to where I am now at my firm. And a lot of my friends, people I work with now, a lot of senior attorneys, a lot of my friends in law school, English majors, history majors, philosophy, psychology, like random degrees that you would think wouldn't help you at all. And a lot of them did better than like the accounting majors and you know, more lucrative, practical majors. Um, I had a lot of friends that I graduated with that went for the lucrative practical majors and I'm making a lot more money than them. Granted, I went to law school, but you know, don't, don't knock the humanities degree, especially people tell you like, oh, what are you gonna do with an English major? Like, well, I'm gonna be a lawyer. <laughs> or like, anything. You can do anything with a humanities degree. It's true. Yeah. yeah. Whereas if, if you study bio, maybe you're a little limited there. Maybe not. I had a friend who had a PhD in medicine who went to law school because she is just a perpetual student. Mm -hmm. But that's really hard to do. Whereas if you have a philosophy degree, you can use that in any field pretty much. Hello everyone. My name is Ariel Miranta. Um, I am a community associate with the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit. Uh, before then, I had actually been a part of the class of 2015, uh, studying philosophy as my major, and then as Dr. Pearson pointed out, I had too many minors. Uh, <laughs> as a business management minor, business law, regulation, and ethics minor, uh, peace and justice studies minor, and as well in ethics. Uh, when I had first come to Fairfield, actually, I was completely unaware of what I wanted to do. Um, I came from a very uh, disadvantaged community. Quite frankly, 25% of the youth population there are unemployed. Uh, there is a number of people who have pretty much grown up being homeless in my area. Uh, there was a number of people who, uh, if you could look at our schools, would pretty much be set up for failure. We had a single digit uh, proficiency rating throughout our entire school district. And because of that, I think that that shaped a lot of my adolescent years, not having an idea for what I could do throughout the rest of my life. And coming to Fairfield, was, uh, I guess, a big shocker to, to say the very least, in the sense that I was all of a sudden being introduced to a number of great minds, some of whom are actually in this room that taught me and 
are, uh, you know, great mentors that I look back on today. Um, to start off, freshman year, that's the, you know, get into the core. Maybe you'll find your way around. And I actually began by taking my first philosophy course, Philosophy 101, uh, with Professor Eric Jimenez. He had been showing me uh, the idea, or rather the, uh, what is it, the allegory of the cave. And I felt like I related to that because this was Fairfield. This was me getting out of the cave that I was in before. Being given the opportunity to learn what is beyond my, uh, I guess, my bubble that had been my adolescent years. And it's actually because of philosophy and that class that I uh, you know, stayed in and did a philosophy major. I started realizing there's so much value in what could be obtained through a philosophy course. Learning to question, learning to think critically, and specifically that came about actually because of course I actually took with Professor Seeley. But because of the influences of the professors here, I was able to grow and take these things with me I developed a sense of understanding, empathy, and really a, a desire to want to change things when I got out of school. Thankfully, I had actually in, been introduced my junior year uh, first to a professor that was teaching uh, the philosophy of ethics, um, Nazar actually, and he had been mentioning that he was sitting on a board of, um, of ethics and I think it was the uh, Institutional Review Board at the Hospital of Bridgeport. From there, I was then given an opportunity because of what I had been doing to meet an amazing Fairfield alumni, Jasmine Fernandez, who had actually been working for the mayor in the city of New York. I was given an opportunity from there to move into her office, which was uh, focusing on pre-K for all. It's actually a nationally wide known uh, initiative that was started to try and uh, open up the number of opportunities for underserved families who had typically not been able to send their children to pre-K. And as you'll find a lot, there's a discussion now about uh, how do we provide adequate care for young single uh, mothers who need to have their children go to school so that they can work. And I saw this opportunity very important for my community because of the number of people who had a lot of children. So this is the interesting thing. We have a lot of children in that area, um, but we're in a very low income neighborhood. Many people could not afford to go to work because of the rising cost of childcare. And so I actually began working, doing outreach in communities that were predominantly Latino and Hispanic in the city of New York. Uh, interestingly enough, 40% of the city of New York is actually Latino and they speak Spanish, of course. Uh, not having, uh, as well because they're immigrants, not having much uh, of an understanding of the way the government and the city of New York works, I was then able to begin showing that new face of government in those communities. I actually reformed the application process for the entire city of New York Department of Education, the largest city of New York, uh, the largest uh, city-run uh, educational department in the country so that it would actually be more applicable to the Latino community. And actually people would be able to understand what was going on when they applied for these programs. So thanks very much to all of our panelists. And uh, you know we had on our docket to go from 6 to 7.30, so I know we're close to that. But if anybody wants to stick around and ask a few questions, um, please feel free to do so. Um, in fact, if anybody has a I know if, if, some, if some of you need to leave, that's fine. But if you have a question for anyone on the panel, um, please ask, and I'm sure they'll be happy to answer. Yeah. Hi, a question for uh, uh, you and um, Jenny, right? Mm -hmm. um, Jenny, um, you talked about, um, in particular, talked about how you know opportunities just kind of come your way. I believe one of your jobs, you described it as you kind of accidentally <coughs> fell into the job. Mm -hmm. um, and I just graduated, and I'm, you know, finding that to be the case. But while I'm waiting for <coughs> things to kind of come to me passively, I don't know what I should be doing in the meantime to try to um, create those circumstances in the first place. Mm -hmm. What should I be doing with myself as I wait for these little opportunities? That's a great question. Um, and I'm going to say work on your network. So, um, uh, we, we all will be part of your network. <laughs> um, 
and it's like the the Kevin Bacon, right? Like the the relationship to Kevin Bacon, whatever the six, whatever it is, six degrees of Kevin Bacon. So, um, I I don't know where you live, maybe in Connecticut, Fairfield. Fairfield. Okay, so um, I might be connected to somebody in Fairfield, somebody I went to undergrad with, and maybe they're connected to somebody who works where you might want to work. Um, and so it's the six degrees of networking that you can be working on now um, so that you can create a whole network of people that you can depend on. And you know, people want to help people. Like, just like we all want to help you, that's why we're here. Uh, people want to help people. And so you, know, you, can, you can email people out of nowhere and say, hey, I went to Fairfield, or I know so-and-so that went to Fairfield. Would you be willing to introduce me? Would you be willing to have coffee with me? I can't tell you how many times in fact, I just um, introduced my husband to a few people that I work for because he's looking for a career change. So um, people are willing to help. So work on your network, definitely. Um, and be open to um, any kind of possibility. Like I said, I started my career um, in nonprofit, and I've swapped careers a few times, and I've been ordering lunches and sweeping floors. Like, I really mean that when I, <laughs> when I say that. Uh, so you know, be humble and, um, and, but I think, you know, really number one is, is your network. It, get on LinkedIn, start connecting with, with students that you went to your undergrad, your parents, friends, your physicians, your neighbors, anybody, um, because that's how you get connected to people. And people want to hire people that they know. And, you know, Megan talked about that as well, that um, it, we, we, we feel more comfortable with people that we know. But it's a great question. And don't worry, you're going to land just fine. <laughs> Could I comment on that? Also, don't be afraid to reach out to people randomly. Um, I, When I was applying for jobs, one of the firms that I applied to was a really big firm. Um, and I was told that, and I really wanted to work for this firm, and obviously I did not get the job, but I was told that to get an interview with this firm, you had to be like top 10% of your class at law school, and I, I was not. Um, but I, out of nowhere, reached out to one of the head partners at that firm who, I believe I did it because he was a Fairfield graduate. It, there was some common denominator between him and I, and I, I, it was, I, I, I didn't know this guy, but I think it was, I think the connection was Fairfield. And I reached out and I said, you know, I. I'm also a Fairfield graduate. I really want to work for your firm. I love what you do, and I would really love an interview with your firm. And I never heard back from him. And then we, I, I ended up getting an interview with the firm. And once I was in, that's all I needed because I had a 10-minute interview with some low-level associate at this firm, and I talked my way into a round two interview, which – if only 15 people got the first interview, only uh, I was the only person who went on. And I'm not temp top 10%, of, I wasn't 10% of my school. So I probably was the least qualified person, but once I was in the interview, I talked my way into the second interview and I was the only person from my school who got that second interview. There's also, there's also such a thing as informational interviews. So you should know that there's such a thing, mm -hmm. you may not be actually interviewing for a job specifically, but you might be just trying to get information from someone to get connected to somebody. And this happens to me all the time. I would say I probably get, I don't know, five to 10 requests a week from people that are in my network of life, right, um, who just are interested in my career, they're interested in working for the FBI, they're working, you know, they're interested in where I grew up, they're interested in Fairfield, they're interested in whatever it is that they're interested in. So it's you can you can actually request just an informational interview like would you have coffee with me would you have lunch can I you know can I meet you uh, to take a walk right it it, it doesn't have to be a, an interview where you're interviewing for a specific job so keep that in mind that if there's something that you are really passionate about you think you really want to know about a company you want to know about a person you want to meet um, some, you know, anything that you want to know about. People are willing to help and you can just ask for information.